All right, so last time we were talking about the tea in Tulip, and uh, if you haven't seen part one and two, I just lay a little groundwork. Um, I'm talking about my, my personal journey in and out of Calvinism and how it nearly led me to walk away from my faith, and so that's why I speak out against it the way that I do. But if you don't understand what Calvinism is and how it can really affect the way that someone thinks and views the world, then you're gonna have a hard time understanding my testimony. That's why I had to lay a little groundwork, but I'm gonna get more into my testimony today. But I started leading worship whenever I was 16 years old. And um, I, in the beginning, I did it from a humble place in my heart, a, a real desire to, to serve the Lord. I wanted to go into ministry. Um, I, I love playing music and I wanted to do that full time. But as the years went on, I started to really backslide and uh, I wasn't reading my Bible, I wasn't praying, not loving my neighbor as myself, and um, just I became a complete, total hypocrite. And this was at a time when I was a five-point Calvinist, and so the thought came into my head one day, I was like, okay, if God determines all things that come to pass, and my backsliding and my hypocrisy are things that have come to pass in my life, then that means that God has determined my hypocrisy that he spoke out against with the scribes and Pharisees. And then I also thought, if God determines everything, then he's determined me to question what he has determined for my life. And so that means that God has determined for me to question what he has determined. And that led me to believe that there was only one of two options. Either God was doing that, or he had determined for me to believe that I was elect, to believe that I was like seed that fell on the good soil, when in fact I was like the seed that fell on the, the rocks and, and the thorns. And I believed that I was elect when I really wasn't. And he was using me as an object of wrath uh, to bring about a good purpose. And so that led me to a really dark place in my life. I started looking into atheistic literature and really studying the theory of evolution and um, so that's just a little bit of my testimony. I'm, I'm gonna keep telling a little bit as I go. But today I wanna talk about uh, the you and Tulip, unconditional election. Um, now, if, if total depravity, as Calvinists define it, is true, and we are all born incapable of responding positively to God and his appeals to be reconciled, and if God determines all things that come to pass, then it logically follows that we must be elected or chosen by God unconditionally. And God's perfect knowledge, and if Calvinism is true, God could not possibly know of our faith or belief and base election on a knowledge of faith because Calvinists believe it is impossible for a totally depraved, unsaved, unregenerate man to ever respond in faith without first being regenerated. And so they teach that election is truly unconditional. And according to John Calvin and even Jonathan Edwards, arbitrary. Or in other words, God has elected individuals before the foundation of the world to be saved to the neglect of all other people. And he does this for no apparent reason. So I wanna go over the Calvinist favorite proof text, as I talked about in part one, that Calvinism lives and, breed, lives and breathes by means of proof texting. And that's, uh, that means when you pluck a verse out of its context to support Calvinism. So, And I wanna show you how Ephesians 1, 4 not only doesn't support Calvinism, but I wanna show you how the Calvinistic interpretation of this passage actually causes a blatant contradiction between verse four and verses one through three. So uh, Ephesians 1, 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So in my opinion, and I would say uh, only second to Romans 9, which I'm going to go over in detail in a future talk, but I would say that Ephesians 1, 4 is one of, of the most common and favorite proof texts that Calvinists use to support unconditional election. So uh, Calvinists will point to Ephesians 1, 4 and say, uh, see, Paul says God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, to be adopted as sons and daughters, to be saved. But does this verse really teach that God chose us before the foundation of the world to be in him, to be saved? Again, I would like to point out that context kills proof text. So the first thing that we need to do is make it clear what this passage does not say. It does not say he chose us to be in him. It says he chose us 
in him. Now, who is Paul referring to when he says, us in him? All we have to do is look at verse 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Faithful in Christ. When Paul says God chose us in him in verse 4, he is saying he chose us, the faithful, in Christ. Now listen as we read through to verse 3. I want to point out the contradiction that Calvinism creates. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul says God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And who are the us in Christ? It's the faithful in Christ, as Paul establishes in verse 1. So in order to receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, we must have faith in Christ. Then Paul goes on to give us an example of a spiritual blessing by saying God has blessed us, the faithful, with every spiritual blessing, even as he chose us. He lists being chosen as an example of a spiritual blessing and he says every spiritual blessing is only ours when we have faith in Christ. But if Calvinism is true, and Ephesians 1.4 is teaching that we are chosen before the foundation of the world, that means we possess a spiritual blessing before we have faith in Christ when Paul says that every spiritual blessing is only ours when we have faith in Christ. Now, any time in the entire New Testament the phrase in Christ is used, it is always referring to those who have faith in Christ. But if unconditional election is true, this means we possessed the spiritual blessing of being chosen before we had faith. And if we possess the spiritual blessing of being chosen prior to faith in Christ, prior to being in him, how can Paul say that we had no hope and were without God prior to faith in Christ when he says we were separated from Christ and alienated from the covenants of promise just in the next chapter, in chapter 2. So what is Paul trying to say in verse 4? Now to help you understand uh, what I believe Paul is saying, I want to give you an analogy. The founding fathers chose us in America before the foundation of the country that we should have freedom and liberty. Now this is a true statement. Any American can claim this about themselves because when we hear this statement, we intuitively understand that the Founding Fathers were not choosing individuals to be citizens. Rather, what they were choosing was that anyone who finds themselves within the corporation of America, citizens, should have freedom and liberty. And this was a decision they made before the foundation of the country. The Founding Fathers chose us, citizens, in America before the foundation of the country, that we, citizens, should have freedom and liberty. Now, in the same way, he chose us, believers, in him before the foundation of the world, that we, believers, should be holy and blameless. God wasn't choosing individuals to be believers. Rather, I believe what God was choosing was that anyone who finds themselves within the corporation of Christ through faith should be holy and blameless. And this was a decision he made before the foundation of the world. So in other words, this was God's plan from the very beginning, that salvation only comes by grace through faith, in the promise that God gave to Abraham, that through him and his capital S seed, as Paul identifies in Galatians as Christ, that all nations of the earth will be blessed through faith in Christ and his finished work on the cross.